Hello, my name is Carol Howell, and I'm with UC Davis Center for Healthy Aging. And today's topic is rheumatoid arthritis. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Wiseman. Dr. Wiseman is Chief of Rheumatology at Cedars Sinai Medical Center and Professor of Medicine at UCLA School of Medicine. His major research interest is in the genetic and environmental risks for chronic rheumatic diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, osteoarthritis, and ankylosing spondylitis. Welcome, Dr. Wiseman. Thank you, Carol, for your introduction. I appreciate it very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you about uh, one of my favorite subjects, and that is rheumatoid arthritis. The, uh, the best way to talk about it, I think, is to, is to tell people what is arthritis and what is rheumatoid arthritis. What does it look like? How do you diagnose it? How do we address it as a rheumatologist, as a physician? And then we're going to talk about how many people actually have arthritis in the United States, and more specifically, how many people have rheumatoid arthritis, which is a very special disease that's nestled in with all the other causes of arthritis. And then I'll focus a little bit on the natural history of rheumatoid arthritis over the past 40 or 50 years and its prognosis once you have rheumatoid arthritis. And then we'll talk about do people actually die from rheumatoid arthritis or do people leave and live a normal life? And has this changed recently? Well, it has, and we'll get into that as we go forward. Now, rheumatoid arthritis is a disease that is very specialized. If you look at this cartoon here, and I'll, and I'll uh, point with the pointer uh, to various parts of the cartoon, you'll see here that there is a tiny little membrane that runs along this joint capsule here. This little membrane is the seat and the soul of rheumatoid arthritis, and it's called the synovial membrane. This is where these immune cells set up shop, proliferate, and produce all of the toxic chemokines and cytokines that actually do the damage to destroy the ligaments, the cartilage, and the bone. And it's this area, this synovium, where we attack the disease with drug management. Now, other kinds of diseases don't involve the synovial membrane, or if they do, they involve it only secondarily, like osteoarthritis, which is a disease of the bone and cartilage. A disease like gout, for instance, is caused by a crystal that deposits inside the joint in the fluid. But rheumatoid arthritis has this very special seat or soul that occurs in the synovial membrane. So we often talk about synovitis, or synovial swelling, that describes the physical features of the disease. Now, the disease also has unique patterns of involvement, and we don't really know why it does this, but it does. And the patterns of involvement take place in the hand predominantly. Now, you all know that there are people with knobby fingers called osteoarthritis. That's not rheumatoid arthritis, and those conditions affect the distal and the proximal interphalangeal joints. If my little pointer shows you a distal joint and a proximal joint here, and the disease is pretty much exclusively confined to these areas. But rheumatoid arthritis affects these joints here, the knuckles or the metacarpal phalangeal joints, and the wrist way down here. This is where the synovial membrane grows and proliferates and causes its damage. So that's where you'll recognize whether people have rheumatoid arthritis or not. Now, what does it actually look like? This is a hand of somebody with established rheumatoid arthritis. You can see very clearly here this thickened swelling here in the wrist. You see it on both sides of the wrist. This is that synovial membrane that's proliferated and grown we call synovitis. You also see swelling across these joints here, these knuckle joints. And you see how it spreads apart the fingers? You also see swelling in these joints out here, the joints that occur with osteoarthritis, because rheumatoid arthritis can affect all the joints in the hand, not just the wrist and the MCP joints, as opposed to osteoarthritis, which almost exclusively just affects these little joints out here. 
So this is an established case of rheumatoid arthritis that anyone or everyone should be able to recognize. However, what I want you to recognize, you the audience, is this is early rheumatoid arthritis. You can see as you look at these two hands, you can see that the hand on your left, the wrist is swollen. Whereas the hand on your right, the wrist is not swollen. Do you see this difference here? This is very important because this is a patient with early rheumatoid arthritis. Why is this important? It's because at this stage of the disease, we treat it and we treat it aggressively to prevent damage and destruction and functional loss that takes place down the line. For those of you who have keen eyes, you also can see that these two joints here are swollen in this hand, whereas these two joints are not swollen in this hand. But I don't expect all of you to be rheumatologists. I just expect some of you to be rheumatologists and recognize the swelling in these joints. But everyone should recognize the swelling in this wrist compared to a normal wrist on the other side. Now, as the disease progresses, you'll see this kind of picture. You see the beginning of that proliferative synovitis here on both sides of the wrist, and now you see the obvious swelling of the knuckle joints here. This is somebody that's had a year or two of aggressive disease. This is another stage of the disease. Now you begin to see the complications of the disease in the hands. For example, you'll see here in the dorsum of the hands or the top of the hands, there's some atrophy. And you see the swelling of these knuckle joints here. And you begin to see these hands turn. They turn a little bit towards the thumb. And so the border of the hand becomes straightened. So you're beginning to see some of the changes that take place in the cartilage, in the ligaments, and in the tendons that support the joint after the disease has progressed. Now what you don't want to see is this. This is a patient with long-standing disease that has caused excessive amount of damage. You see how the hands are twisted or turned. This is what we call the Z or the zigzag deformity of rheumatoid arthritis. You'll notice here how this border here is straightened. The wrist is rotated here toward the thumb and the fingers are rotated out toward the other side of the hand producing the zigzag deformity. You'll also see here that these fingers here and perhaps on this side better are tucked underneath the knuckles. What happens is that the end of one bone moves underneath the end of the other bone, which we call subluxation. So after damage takes place in the cartilage and supporting structures, the joints become distracted from one another. You don't want this to happen. This is what we try and prevent by our management of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So now that I've shown you what it looks like and what it could look like if you don't treat it properly, let's talk a little bit and slow down about who has rheumatoid arthritis. How often does it occur? The study that was done here in this particular paper looked at two bits of information. It looked at questionnaires and data that were out in the public where we asked people, do you have arthritis? Now that's not a very good way of figuring it out, but it's a rough approximation. So if you ask people in the public, you just ask anybody, whether a telephone survey or questionnaire, and you ask them how many people in the United States will report doctor-diagnosed arthritis of any kind, the answer is about 20%. About 20% of people will say that they, their doctor diagnosed arthritis. But that's not rheumatoid arthritis. Now you have to get more specific. Now you have to go out and examine people. So you do these health surveys where you take trucks or vans and go out into the public and actually take people off the street and bring them in and examine them and determine from a physical examination and some laboratory tests how many actually have rheumatoid arthritis. Now that's what I'm going to show you on the next slide. On the top of this slide are women and the bottom of the slide are men. 
And what this is, is by decades, this is what's called the prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis in the population. So you can see the bars going from 1965 to 1995 for each age group, for women on the top and men on the bottom. And I want to make two points about rheumatoid arthritis. The first point is that the prevalence of the disease increases as you get older. So the highest prevalence of the disease is between 65 and 75. We used to think it was younger, between 40 and 60, but actually the highest prevalence is between 65 and 75. And that's true of both men and women. The second point is very interesting. If you look at the bars, you actually see that the prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis is actually declining in the last decade. And if we had another bar that said 2005, this, this particular bar would probably be down here because we have evidence now that it's declining even more. So this is strange. Rheumatoid arthritis is actually declining in prevalence in the United States and in the world. Why is this happening? Well, we'll get into that as we go forward here. Now, I promised you that we talk about the natural history of the disease as we've known it as physicians. In order to do that, you have to go way back to the 1930s and 1940s. And I pulled this paper out of a publication in the 1950s that looked at the natural history or follow-up of rheumatoid arthritis patients at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston from the 1930s to the 1950s. And what this slide shows is that patients did not do well with rheumatoid arthritis. You'll notice in the 1930s, that is listed under 1937 here, you'll see that many of the patients were actually doing reasonably well when they were first seen. But when you get out to the 1950s, two-thirds of them were in a progressive state. Now, our treatment at the time that this study was done was really simple. It was bed rest and aspirin. These patients were hospitalized, given aspirin until their ears rang, and then the aspirin was backed off. This was the only treatment we had for rheumatoid arthritis in the 30s and 40s. And as you can see, aspirin and bed rest was not a good treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. So let's fast forward now to the 1960s in New York City. And this is a follow-up study of 500 patients seen in New York City over 16 years, where the standard treatment in New York was gold injections and cortisone. As you can see at the beginning, at the first visit, many of these patients we're in stages one and two, which is better than stages three and four. Now, if you go up to 16 years later, over half of these patients were in stages three and four. So this treatment, whatever it was in New York in the 1960s into the 1970s was not very good. Now let's forward this now to the late, the mid to the late 1980s. This is a 20-year follow-up of patients with rheumatoid arthritis in a teaching hospital in London. And these investigators looked at patients when they started and followed them out over 20 years, a cohort of about 100 patients. As you can see on the initial visit, these patients actually weren't doing too badly and they improved at five years. So you see that the number of cases at five years were in stages in functional classes one and two. But you go out over 20 years, over half of these patients were either dead or severely disabled by their disease. So if you were in England in the 1980s, you would have a greater than 50% chance with your rheumatoid arthritis of either being dead or severely disabled after 20 years. I remember when this study was presented to our national meeting and people shook their heads and they said, what are we doing? 
we're just presiding over a terrible thing. We're not doing anything for our patients. And everyone became discouraged. But things changed. Now, along with this functional loss, you have to look, too, at mortality data. And at the Mayo Clinic, our colleagues have shown us that during the same time period, from the 50s and 60s to the 70s and into the 1980s, patients with rheumatoid arthritis died at a greater rate than the general population. And what they showed here is the survival of patients with rheumatoid arthritis on this, on this kind of curvy line during all three time periods. But you'll notice that, of course, the survival is worse than the general population, but this general population actually improved in survival over from 1965 to 1985, whereas there was no improvement of survival in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So again, we became very discouraged in the 1980s about our treatment and outcome of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. But suddenly, things began to change for patients with rheumatoid arthritis in the 1990s. How did this happen and why did this happen? Well, I'm going to give you four really good reasons for why this happened and what we're doing about it today. The first reason is we finally found a drug that worked, a drug called methotrexate. Now, methotrexate was known to us since the 1940s when it was first used to treat arthritis. But what happened was, in the 1940s, another drug was discovered to treat arthritis, and it totally eclipsed the use of methotrexate, and that drug was cortisone. And methotrexate went to sleep for probably close to 40 years until it was resurrected in the United States in the early 1980s and approved for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis in 1985. And it's a drug that's a, that's a cancer drug, but we use it in low doses, and we use it every week, and we keep the dose below a threshold that causes significant or serious side effects. And it turns out that almost all of our patients today, probably two-thirds of them, are taking methotrexate as their basic therapy. Now, the second reason why things changed for rheumatoid arthritis in the 1990s was we began to act like oncologists, like cancer doctors. We began to use combinations of drugs aggressively to almost debulk or turn off the disease when we see it, and then back off and eliminate these drugs one by one over time. In the old days, and I remember the old days and the new days, we used drugs one by one. Now we use them all together and then back off. The third reason is that our research began to pay off. We've now discovered new treatments that are targeted towards specific molecules that are important in what happens to the rheumatoid arthritis patients. In the old days, we used sledgehammer-like drugs, or chemotherapy, if you will, which destroyed as many good cells as it did bad cells. Today, we can target just the molecules that are causing the damage. And that's very important. The fourth reason is probably the most important reason, is that we've now discovered that we treat early, very early and aggressively, when we see a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. Like that second patient I showed you earlier that had swelling in one wrist and then swelling in the knuckle joints, that's when we institute therapy. We don't wait until the disease looks like the first patient I showed you or the third or the fourth patient. That's too late. So these are the four reasons why the outlook has changed. And how do we demonstrate that? Well, this is a survival curve of European patients over 10 years with rheumatoid arthritis into the 21st century. And you can see on this survival curve that these patients lived just as long as the general population over 10 years. 
So we've begun to do something with this treatment. And even if you go to the Mayo Clinic and talk to the Mayo Clinic doctors, you can see also that the survival, even at the Mayo Clinic currently, is not all that different from the general population. You'll see here that there's the expected survival of the general population, and then there's the observed survival of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And you begin to see only an important separation take place after about 10 years. Actually, this separation that takes place after 10 years is probably related more to rheumatoid arthritis patients having heart disease than it is from the rheumatoid arthritis itself. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now here's the drug methotrexate. We use it by mouth or by injection, and we use it once a week in very low doses. This is the combination therapy that we use. We use a whole bunch of drugs at the beginning. We stack them on top of each other. Actually, we don't use hardly any of these drugs today because this was the first combination suggestion in the literature. And you can see that we just drop them off one by one until the least toxic drug remains as a maintenance therapy. So we use methotrexate as our baseline therapy, and we use combinations of drugs as our basic therapy. And this is the whole panoply of incredible biologic advances that have taken place in our field. If you look at the top of the slide here, you see all these names, CD25, CD80, CD28, all of these molecules, all the way from the bloodstream here down to the cartilage and bone here. These molecules interact with one another and recruit cells in and recruit other cells out and talk to each other in various phases. And I can assure you that every single one of these molecules is a target for therapy today in rheumatoid arthritis. There are antibodies against these molecules. There are receptor antagonists against these molecules. There are all kinds of tricks that we can play on these molecules. And these are what our new biologic therapies are for rheumatoid arthritis. And believe me, this is both NIH funded and pharmaceutical company funded research that has come together so that we can target our treatment toward very specific things that occur in rheumatoid arthritis. Now again, this is the last reason, probably the most important reason, why our treatment has made a difference today. Now it's difficult to see on this slide what exactly I mean, but let me explain it to you. What I have here is over time, over five years, showing you the rate of development of bone changes or damage to patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And it's that bone damage that we want to prevent. These are called joint erosions. And you can see on this slide that there is a very rapid rate of increase of these bone changes in the first three years. It ramps up rather quickly. And then it tends to level off after three years. So that if you want to intervene to prevent bone damage, you really ought to treat in this window here in the first three years. That's what this slide means. That early treatment and aggressive treatment makes the biggest difference long term to prevent damage to patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So let's summarize where we've been so far in this talk and where we are as we wind it up. First of all, Rheumatoid arthritis is a very special kind of chronic arthritis. It's associated with inflammation. That inflammation begins in that synovial membrane, and it can go out and destroy all the other structures in the joint. Now, how many people have rheumatoid arthritis? Well, all those self-reported arthritis, self-reported doctor-diagnosed arthritis is very common in the population. Real rheumatoid arthritis probably occurs with a prevalence of about 0.5 to 1% of the population over the lifetime of an individual. Until the 1990s, 
having a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis meant that you had a shortened lifespan. Not only that, it promoted significant functional loss and disability and negative effects on the quality of patients' lives, as well as the lives of other family members. But times have changed. Rheumatoid arthritis patients today have a normal life expectancy. They no longer have the significant functional disability and damage that we knew in the 40s and 50s and 60s and even into the 70s and 80s. And finally, we've evolved in our concept of rheumatoid arthritis management by doing several things. One is we've discovered new molecules, but probably more important, we're treating early and we're treating aggressively with combinations of drugs. So we've begun to turn the disease around. Now, even though we've turned the disease around, we've also discovered something really interesting in that the disease itself is probably disappearing slowly in the United States and around the world. And we're going to talk about that in the next session to follow. Thank you very much for allowing me to be with you today. Joint pain. We've all had it at one time or another, and it can be uncomfortable to say the least. But is there a safer, better alternative to this complex problem? Well, I'm glad you asked. The answer is yes. Researchers have identified some key building blocks in our joints and cartilage and have found naturally occurring sources of them in our environment. By adding these ingredients into our diets, scientists have found some wonderful results with regard to joint health. Chondroitin is a major building block involved in the formation and repair of cartilage, the tough, flexible tissue that cushions the joints. Chondroitin also helps attract water into the cartilage matrix, which in turn prevents bone-to-bone -bone contact, especially in the weight-bearing joints, such as the knees and hips. The optimum daily dose of chondroitin is 1,200 milligrams, which usually involves taking three to four tablets per day. Glucosamine is found in high concentrations in joint tissues. It is used in the production of chondroitin. However, as we age, our bodies decrease the natural production of glucosamine. Therefore, supplementation of this joint structural component is important. While individually, glucosamine and chondroitin are effective, clinical studies have shown that the combination is particularly beneficial in reducing symptoms of joint pain and stiffness. Sulfur is a component of healthy hair, skin, nails, tendons, and joints. MSM, a naturally occurring organic sulfur compound, provides the essential sulfur that is necessary to build strong collagen and therefore strong and healthy cartilage. Seladrin is a patented blend of cetylated fatty acids. This category of fatty acids have been shown to improve joint range of motion and Seladrin is thought to exert its effects by enhancing cell membrane health and integrity as well as by increasing joint lubrication. I was rear-ended in a car accident and my hip, my shoulder, um, and my neck on the right side were in constant pain. Two to three times a week I was going to a chiropractor and it wasn't helping it. I started taking Flex and three days later my pain was gone. What's great is that these compounds are safe and can be used on a long-term basis. What's even better is Agile's patented Flex. This formulation is a first because it has all four of these ingredients in one formulation. It's no surprise that Agile Flex was awarded as the best new supplement by the American Business Awards. Pick up yours today. You'll be amazed. <laughs>